Judith's Story, Part 1 of the Presentation on the Circle of Friends, was videotaped at the 1991 Conference on Inclusive Catholic Education, sponsored by the University of Dayton. Judith's Story was presented by Jack Pierpoint of the Center for Integrated Education and Community of Toronto, Ontario. Jack Pierpoint, a former college president, is now the co-director of the Center. This presentation has been edited for viewing purposes. We're going to begin an exploration of what this is all about, and we're going to do, we're going to tell a story. I, I, I like telling stories. And so we're going to tell you a story about a person we know called Judith Snow, and that is a way of beginning the story of how Circle of Friends as we work with it sort of came to happen. So I have to introduce you to Judith, who was 42 a couple of weeks ago. We had a party. But uh, Judith has congenital progressive atrophy of the skeletal muscles due to spinal muscu muscular atrophy. It's been in remission since 78. But she has complete quadriplegia with full bowel and bladder function low power and limited range of motion in her right thumb, no other power or range of motion in limbs. This is permanent. She has significant loss of cranial nerve function, including Horner's syndrome in the left eye, difficult in swallowing due to Horner and diverticulosis of the esophagus, permanent. Limited mandible motion in large tongue with spasticity, typical of spinal muscular atrophy, permanent. Inguinal hernia repaired once. Hiatus hernia 70 ongoing. Harrington instrumentation 72 for severe scoliosis. Resulted in semi paralysis, left side body, loss of left hand. Temporary paralysis, right hand recovered partially. 76. Hand totally paralyzed except for minimal movement in thumb. Spinal fusion C5 to S1, 72. Bilateral girdle stone, hip joints, 72. Repeated procedure, 78, 88. Arthritis, knees, right shoulder due to lack of muscular support for joints. Sleep, acmea, 26%, typical air volume for age, corrected with continuous positive air pressure. Ventilator at night, non-infectious, non-viral hepatitis, inflammation, kidneys, kidney stones, irregular menses, allergies, sodium benzoate, sulfa drugs, food dyes, osteoporosis, decalcification, tendency to edema. That's Judith. You want to know her? Is that anyone you're interested in meeting? <laughs> A few people might say sure. Most people would freak out. So I want to introduce you to Judith a different way. And if you can turn down the lights. Maybe, I don't know if you can be able to see. Maybe we can turn out these too and that'll be better. Up where? Oh, is that all locked in there? Can I? All right. This is Judith Snow. Now, this is not denying all that other stuff, but this is the person that I know and am quite interested in spending a good chunk of time with. This is Judith in her apartment. Um, and this is not a special apartment. This is an apartment. It's not on the first floor. It's on the 10th floor. There are no special fire escapes or sort of tubes off the 10th floor or anything else. It's the 10th floor, just like all the other apartments. Judith is sitting in her apartment in her wheelchair, and she's typing at 35 words a minute on her laptop. She uses a sip and puff system which controls lights, phone, a variety of other things, and runs a Morse code overlay on the keyboard so she types and runs a variety of programs on her computer. <clears throat> and I want to tell you some stories about Judith, you see, because Judith is a really strange character. She wants to live. <laughs> and I know this is a really strange um, circumstance because, you see, Judith wasn't supposed to live. Judith wasn't supposed to do anything. Judith was supposed to be dead when she was two, and seven, and 11, and 15, and 20, and 25. And the outer limit of life for Judith 
was to be 30. And so you need to know that when Judith was approaching 30, which is about when we met her, um, she wasn't doing very well. She had graduated from York University. Uh, her parents had done just about everything possible that one can do to get her there. And uh, it was a carefully selected university. It was selected because it was flat. And it had some degrees of accessibility. Um, and Judith decided that, with her parents, that if she could get a really good education, she might figure out how to live. So she went to university. She graduated with her master's degree, high honors, all that stuff, and moved into a nursing home, which was the only facility in Canada that could provide attendant care. Because legally, 13 years ago in Canada, if Judith was disabled, she could not work. And if she could work, she could not be disabled. <laughs> An interesting dilemma, if you happen to be someone like Judith. So she decided that she wanted to work, which technically was a breach of the law. But the only place they could allow her to live, since her parents were older and could no longer lift her, because her total physical mobility is a quarter inch in her right thumb, she needed a lot of help to do things, physically. And the only place that could figure out how to get her up in the morning and put her to bed at night and feed her on occasion was a nursing home, a geriatric ward. And they did that for a while. But Judith drove them crazy because she wasn't interested in being a geriatric patient at 25. She wanted to be a citizen. And so she got up and she invented a job for herself at the university. She created a position where she was going to help other people to figure out how to go to university who hadn't been there or couldn't go there or weren't sure they belonged there. And she was really good at it. And she managed to get the university to fund it to the extent of providing a little bit of extra money for an attendant who could help her during the day, an office space, a phone, with one minor deficiency in her plan, there was no salary. <laughs> but Judith being Judith, she decided to do it anyway. And she struggled for almost five years, living and working from a nursing home. Now you have to appreciate that nursing homes are not designed to get people up in order to go to work in the morning. You don't do that in nursing homes. And so Judith had to spend her savings all of them, in order to hire someone to get her out of bed before 11 o'clock. And then when she got to university, she could talk other people and help get other people and students to help her. But when she got back from meetings in the evening, on average, she'd missed the 5 o'clock dinner hour. So it was very common that she didn't get fed. And it was extraordinarily common that her need to go to the bathroom, which is one of these strange things that most of us have to do from time to time, could not be fit into the schedule because that was scheduled for mid-afternoon, not late evening. And so over time, Judith began to get very ill. And as she approached her 30th birthday, she was getting very sick. She was suffering from what turned out to be malnutrition because she wasn't getting fed. And when she wasn't getting fed, she, doctors came and looked at her and said, this woman is malnourished, we better give her some vitamins. So they gave her a whole bunch of vitamins. And the vitamins, oddly enough, came in little red capsules. No one noticed, but Judith was allergic to all red dyes. So Judith began to get ill, more ill. And that added to the problem of edema because she wasn't getting to go to the bathroom, and as she got sicker and she retained more water, one thing happened, and then more drugs were needed to accommodate all these problems that she began to have. And eventually, Judith ended up on the emergency ward in the hospital, suffering from severe malnutrition and edema. And she thought, because she was about 29 and a half at that point, and she had been acculturated for 29 and a half years that she was going to die when she was 30. 
she thought this was the end, that she was dying. And so did everybody else. This was right on the plan. So nobody was very worried about the fact that Judith was sick and Judith was dying. Even Judith was pretty convinced that she was dying, very convinced she was dying. So her issue as she lay in the hospital was deciding where she was going to die. Not whether, not even when, because it was going to be very soon. And she decided she was not going to die on a geriatric ward. That was not a good place to die. She wanted to die in the community. She was not going to die in the hospital. She was going to die with people in Toronto, somewhere, somehow. She didn't know how. But she left the hospital, and she didn't go back to the geriatric ward. You talk about high risk. She cannot eat. She cannot go to the bathroom. She cannot move an inch without help. And she leaves the hospital, leaves the geriatric ward, has no money, no attendant care system, and is prepared to die. This is a person who's got a fair bit of gumption. And what she did was she went to some of her friends and said, and she, I mean, she'd done a fair bit of lobbying, as a number of us, with the government, and we had this vague letter of promise, so-called, that in the future, there would be a place for Judith to live. And so she decided, she actually borrowed somebody else's attendant care system and lived in a hallway for, home, for the better part of a year in a university residence and recruited students to help her get up and continue her work while she tried to figure out how to, how to survive until this new program that she was inventing came into being. And then came the day, as they often do, when it turned out that yet another new program was going to be wonderful and going to be open very soon. But like every other program that Judith had designed and lobbied for in Ontario, it was good for a lot of people, but it wasn't good enough for Judith. She was too handicapped, and so she couldn't be fit there either. About that time, Judith stopped talking. This is her only communication link with the world. And she rolled into a friend's office and she said, I can't do it anymore. And she stopped. <coughs> she really didn't say anything. Now this is quite a message from someone who's struggling for their life, who you know is on a very, very thin edge, and whose only link to the world is through her voice. So you have to learn to listen real hard to what the message is, because it isn't being said in words. And the message was very simple. If you want me to live, if you want me in the world, you're going to have to figure it out. I can't do it anymore. I can't do it alone. And so that day, Judith ended up at our house. And we rallied just about everybody we could think of because there was no plan. And we got 14 people in the room and we said, what are we going to do? Because we want Judith to live. And we figured it out. Now that's 13, 13 years ago. It isn't finished just so you don't have any illusions. We didn't figure it out. We figured out that day, we figured out the next day, hour by hour, and let me tell you, it was hour by hour. <laughs> when you have to figure out attendant care on a 24-hour basis, you do it hour by hour sometimes. But we began. And two weeks ago, we celebrated Judith's 42nd birthday, and we're planning a lot more birthdays because we figured it out. With her circle of friends, Judith has become a worldwide speaker and traveler. She recently went to Europe, despite a reoccurring medical problem. Over her doctor's objections, she checked herself out of the intensive care unit 
and flew to Scotland to address an institute on inclusion. Judith Snow has learned that with her circle of friends, life can be full of laughter, fun, and adventure. Now, the, the essence of really getting better is feeling good. And to feel good, you've got to do neat stuff that you're interested in, like being with your friends. And in this case, like going to England. So she didn't tell Air Canada that she'd just been really, really, that she just released herself <laughs> from intensive care. She just got on the plane and she went to England. And she taught at the Institute. And that weekend, we all went to, because John Hall, uh, uh, one of the people with lesser hair, a major disability, <laughs> John Hall said, oh, you got to come to our house for the weekend. And we, I said, oh, that would be great, John. How accessible is your house? And he said, oh, I think we have a few steps. <laughs> that was one of the sets of 27 steps that we went to spend with Judith there. And there's, you see, the important thing was spending time with John and Joe. That's the the organizer of the, of the institute. And we had a good time. We celebrated. And that made Judith get better. And we did important things. Like what she really wanted to do was pig out. <laughs> and she ate every creamed thing known to English. Because you see, her father was born right near there. And she wanted to see where he came from and eat all the things that he used to rave about. And she did. And she started to get better. And you see, Judith can't have children, but you can. I mean, Father Pat can be a parent. It doesn't mean you have to be a parent parent. And this is Judith enjoying life, being part of creating a new generation. And that's important stuff. And that's, what mean, that's why you know, Judith is better now. This is, we just acquired a little schoolhouse in Algonquin Park, which is a wonderful wilderness park, which has some of the best whitewater river in, on the continent, I think. We just got this with Father Pat, actually. And Judith announced she was coming up for the weekend, so we arranged to have a local contractor build a ramp. <laughs> and you can see that in a very small village where the time scale operates on quite a different time scale than I had in mind, it didn't get built. <laughs> so we brought ramps. Not a big deal. It's not ideal, but Judith got in to the schoolhouse. And when she got into the schoolhouse, she announced that <clears throat> she wanted to go canoeing because we're in canoe country. And to make the point, she said, I brought my wheelchair insert. I, uh, so we began to go canoeing. And we took Judith from her $27,000 high-tech computerized wheelchair, which scratches her back and does all kinds of neat things. And we bungee corded her into a little chair from an old chair. And we... <clears throat> got ready. And then we carried her across the road and down a very steep, emb steep embankment, which didn't look too terrifying until we got to the top of it, but, uh, <laughs> but we did. And then we began loading Judith into the canoe. Now, at this point, there's a whole bunch of things going on. You have to appreciate that lots of people have different reactions to this kind of reality. Uh, <clears throat> some of the reactions Marsha being one of them, not to name names, but <laughs> Marsha didn't think this was a great idea. So we managed to turn this crisis from danger into opportunity. We weren't denying danger, but we said, go and get the camera, use the energy, take pictures. <laughs> so, uh, so Marsha was diverted. <laughs> uh, in some ways, unfortunately, there were more people there and we couldn't find enough diversion. So my mother, my mother, who was wearing a red sweater, was uh, <coughs> maintaining Marsha's perspective with, with clarity. <laughs> and she was saying, this is stupid. <laughs> this, 
you're, this is really silly. I mean, you're, <clears throat> you're going to give Judith hypothermia because it's cold. And I did a little bit of debating a long time ago, and the minute she said hypothermia, I knew I was going to win because she was focused on the wrong problem, something we're all pretty good at. See, when you go canoeing, the problem is not hypothermia. The problem is drowning. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you survive drowning, then hypothermia <laughs> becomes a problem. So you got to get them in the right order. So, so we did our best to avoid drowning. We tied life jackets onto Judith as best we could, and we tied her to the thwart of the canoe. Not recommended canoe procedure, but nonetheless, that was what we decided was the healthiest. And if you can see it clearly, at this particular moment, in addition to this debate, Judith is having third, fourth, and 29th thoughts about whether she really wants to go canoeing. But she did get the last word, and we went canoeing. Now, there are lots of things about this picture that are sort of fun. One is that if I'd started with this picture, how many of you, and not said anything about Judith, how many of the, you would think she's a paddler? Judith would. <laughs> Loves it. There's no wheelchair in that picture. That's Judith canoeing, just like a lot of people canoeing. I've taken a lot of people canoeing who paddle about the same rate. <laughs> Now, you have to know, this is on the Madawaska River, which has some spectacular rapids. Some of them just a half mile down the river from here. We didn't go there. <laughs> we decided that in a, birch, in, a, in a cedar strip canoe and with Judith, that wasn't the best thing to do. But we paddled. And it's fall. And this is maple country. And the colors are spectacular every color in the rainbow, and they're all there. And we just went out, and we paddled around for a half hour. We just wandered about. And there's your evaluation. Is it a good idea? Now, of course, it's impossible. None of this can be done unless you dream. And what most of us spend a lot of time doing is listing all the dangers, thinking of all the reasons that things can't be done, because we've been trained to do that. There's legal reasons, there's insurance reasons, there's social... Um, make your list. It goes on forever. Alternatively, if you want to go canoeing, you can just do it. You can just do it. And to do it, what we recommend is you begin building a circle of friends. This video was produced by the Center for Ministry with Disabled People of the University of Dayton in Dayton, Ohio. Circle of Friends Part 2, The Circle Procedure. This presentation was delivered at the 1991 Inclusive Catholic Education Conference, sponsored by the University of Dayton. Presenters are Marcia Forrest and Jack Pierpoint, 
co-directors of the Centre for Integrated Education and Community in Toronto. Marcia Forrest, a former special education teacher, is a leading advocate for education which includes all students. Jack Pierpoint is a former college president who has developed models of adult literacy education. Marcia and her husband Jack developed the Circle of Friends process. This presentation has been edited for viewing purposes. When we met Judith, her circle looked pretty much like this. And if you, some of you later on in the day, start looking at the circles of some of the people with labels that you know. Now again, this has nothing to do with disability because that is the picture of somebody who is a very good candidate for suicide. That is the picture of somebody who's a very good candidate for addiction. Because what it says, if you translate it, and we'll tell you how to do that in a minute, is that you have an outer circle full of people, and that's the circle we call the paid circle. So you have a full circle of paid human service workers, professionals, etc. And toward the core of the person's life, you have only two people, many of whom, in, in cases of, of people with labels, is parents who are biologically linked and often not emotionally linked. OK? So the, if you're really hearing this, what you'll see is a lot of the kids in your schools who don't have obvious labels have lives that look like that, but you don't know that. And as you bring in the catalyst, as Sister Mary was saying this morning, as the kids with obvious disabilities come in, it loosens up some of these other kids to talk. OK, now, we want circles to look like this. That is the picture of a healthy person. That's the way Judith Snow's life looks now. It's like. Her cards are full, folks. She doesn't have time to go dancing. You know, I mean, it's like, my card's full. I always say to her, Judith, why don't you be like a normal person with a disability and stay put? I mean, she just is off. She's in Texas. I mean, she's in Texas. She's here. She's there. She's all over the place. I can't ever find her, right? I mean, my, people who don't take three hours to get up in the morning can't do what she does, right? So she threatens the hell out of a lot of people. This, this Tuesday, this coming Tuesday evening, she's invited to have dinner with the new Minister of Education in Ontario, and she can't make it because she's in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> she's busier than the minister. And, and, but, you know, that, again, you can take that two ways. Whose problem is that? Our perspective is the minister has a problem. She needs Judith, not the other way around. And we're all confused. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's what we're aiming for. Okay, that's the picture that you want for every child in your classroom, for every child in, in your school. And the thing that I would look at as you are now going to do your pictures is how much diversity is in that picture is also a sim symbol of health. So I would say we're doing pretty good in this room, but wouldn't it be nice if we added more and more levels of diversity as we develop these courses so that we strive in the programs we run to say, my God, we're missing something here. We, we ain't got a lot of racial diversity. This is in, in some of our work in Toronto. Now, I know it's funny. In Catholic school, you can't have that much diversity because it's a Catholic school. But you might want to invite some people in, like Jewish persons once in a while, or you know, rabbis, or wasps, or, or, or whatever. OK, so we, we're. We are going to do unto you what you are eventually going to do unto people in your school. And here's an interesting mistake you can get into. This afternoon or tomorrow, we're going to talk to you about an experience we went through in Colorado. And I was going to, I volunteered to this principal that we work with. I said, gee, we'll come in and we'll train your special ed people how to do this. And he stopped me cold and he said, no, Marsha, I want all my teachers to know how to do this. And I thought, ooh, ooh, good mistake. Good, I love when I make good, good mistake, right? And so he said, I want everybody who's a teacher
to know this stuff so that when they bump into a child who's vulnerable, because this, again, this is not about disability, this is about vulnerability. And for me and for Jack, the reason we're going to spend time on this today is this is the foundation of the house. This is the foundation of the house for inclusion. I want kids who, know, want, who are going to be phys physicists and physicians, I want them to know all the academics and the physics and the music and the art and the Latin, okay? I don't want them to commit suicide. So this has to do with the brightest, the brightest academic students. This has to do with your children. This has to do with, lately, we're getting phone calls from very interesting new phone calls. Head Injury Association, burn clinics. Burn clinics, isn't that interesting? How do you get a kid back into a regular system who is badly, badly disfigured? You pretend that that doesn't exist? How do you talk to people about that? How do you build that person's life back? This has to do with people who have had strokes, who are labeled senior citizens. Do, do you see the connections? This, the gift was that the person with the disability taught us this paradigm, OK? So what we need for all of you to do is to draw that picture on a blank piece of paper and just sit with your circle and you're going to do this for the next few minutes. Right around this ring. I want you to put the names of the people that are the very closest to your heart. So I'll give you, for example, for me it's very simple. It's Jack. It's Judith. It's Father Pat. funny saying this because I don't want you to laugh at me, but it's, my dog just died, and she was a really close person in my life, and I know that may sound silly, but I felt funny saying that, but that's my principle. It could be the spirit of people, it could be pets, it could be concepts. Just take some time and fill in your first circle. working on that first circle, just start thinking about the second circle, which is close but not as close. That's a very simple direction. It's just not quite the first but close. And you might want to put a couple of people even in the middle. There's no rules here. When you're ready, the third circle, the only addition to the third circle, are it can include groups of people. And some, some people with full lives, kids with full lives, they go to hockey, they may go to ballet, church. So it can be people or groups of people. It could be couples, it could be I mean, there's no, there's no right or wrong here. As you're designing this, as you're going along, the fourth circle is very simple, and I don't want you to spend a lot of time on it because it's people that you pay to be in your life, and that could be your auto mechanic and your doctor. And, but now you may start thinking, as in my circle, my doctor is also a person in my second circle. So some people may be in a few places, and that's fine too.
Now, I, my hope is that some of you will spend a fair amount of time looking at this over the next day and a half and sharing it with one of your friends here or somebody that you trust enough to share it with. But just as people are doing it, and feel free to keep doing it, i just like to hear there's a couple of key questions that we've learned to ask from this. And the first one is, I just want to get a flavor of this from some of you, is in looking at your own circles, did anything, did you get a particular insight or learning? And I'll share my own with you. When I first did this, what I realized is that there was nobody in my biological family anywhere. It, 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 it was absolutely stunning. Now, for me, that was, I didn't like that very much. And it's now five years or 10 years, I don't remember when we first started doing this, but now I have reconnected with some of my family. For me, that was important. And I learned that when I did the exercise. Did anybody else get a particular aha? For you, most of the circle is family. If your, thank you. If your circles didn't look like that, if your circles looked more like this, you, the, remember, I'm not talking about anybody else now. I want you to focus on you. If your circles looked like that, Give me some feeling words, like what would you feel like? Depressed, isolated, empty, broke, withdrawn, unlovable, alone, angry, frustrated, scared, sad, lost, needy, rejected, worthless, helpless. Now that list, that list that Jack puts up, and you can spend some time looking at it, it's a very important list. It's also universal. It's a universal list. But the question we didn't used to ask, which now is much more key to how would you feel, and again, this is you, if something, God forbid, happened and that your circle didn't look like that anymore, and your circle looked more like what I've got up there on the overhead, how would you act? What would you do? You'd be angry. I'd, I'd act angry. I'd be defensive. Okay. She would say, I would rather die. I don't want to know what I, what would you do? I would bury myself in something else. Okay, I'd bury myself in something else. I'd go inside, I'd be more withdrawn. 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 Fine, you can use the same words. I'd do nothing, I'd climb into bed and cover up with the covers there. Yeah, I, I'd do nothing. Put on a facade. I'd put on a facade, okay. What would you do? I, I'd get angry because I'd feel that you know, I, I would say, you know, enough, enough. Okay. I mean, my son would be thrown in and give me an order. Okay. You, I'm trying to get the action that goes with I, that. I would, I would uh, I guess what you said about being defiant and stuff, because, because it's like I don't, if you just said something like Susan, I don't want to listen anymore. I'd be defiant. Okay. I would hurt. Okay, now it's, in, it's always interesting doing this with adults. I want you to pretend that you're 15 years old and I asked you this question. What you said was fine, perfect. Okay, it's a, but it's adult responses. When we do this with kids over the age of 10, what do you think they say right away? Okay, drinking, drugs. And suicide. <laughs> you got it. Not in that order. Suicide is first. 
I mean, it's a frightening thing. Jack, Jack and I do this a lot with teenagers. It is absolutely frightening. The first thing out of their mouths, the f absolutely first thing, I commit suicide. Remember the survey we told you about, and we're going to talk to you more about this high school situation, the survey that when the kids were asked, do you feel you belong in the school community? And blah, blah, 70, when was it? 75 percent of the kids in grade 10 and above said no. They did not have a sense of belonging to their high school community. There is your breeding ground for gangs, racism, and violence. Now, I, I love this story because this is the experience of, of, of a very, very wonderful special ed person that I know in Montreal. As we were doing this one day, she started doing what I consider severely beha dis behavior disordered behavior. She started, literally, she was going like this. You know, like, oh. Now, why was she doing that? Like, why was she, what, what, she had this insight about this point in the presentation. Okay, well, you're shaking your head, why? I have one of those. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, a, that's not my question. The, the teacher, was saying. I'm doing the same thing. I'm acting out the same way she is. But why? But she, she had a deeper insight. You're right. I'm pushing you. You're not wrong. You're right. But why was this person going, <coughs> knocking her head? Pardon? Why didn't I think of that before? Why didn't I look at this before? Why didn't I ever think of this before? Why for two years have we been bringing in the behavior modification SWAT team, putting the kid in time out, trying to fix him? Why didn't we ask the key question, which is a very important question, which is who loves this person? Why do we ask everything else in schools, but why, do, why does the last thing that we often do in terms of behavior to look at who loves this person? And what is that behavior, whether it's smearing feces or bashing, what does that communication tell us? In 99% of kids with the kind of behavior problems that you all want to figure out how to deal with, the but what about kids, nobody sits down long enough to figure out who is in this kid's life. And usually the answer for everybody I've dealt with is I can't even tell you that it's worse than this picture. It's nobody. <coughs> it's nobody. Or it's a teenager who just has parents. Or it's a Judas. See, I don't even, the Jack and I have talked about this. We don't even, Judas' picture didn't even look like this when we met her. Because she had really lost contact with her family. So depression, all this acting out stuff, you have to rule out this. Now, sometimes you can rule it out. In, in one, many situations, not many, a few where a kid's going berserk and you really check the stuff out, then the second thing to check out is what? Medical stuff. Because if somebody's really flipping out, like one teenager we know was, there was a real hormonal problem. So we checked that out. But first thing we asked was, what does this look like? And we found out it looked pretty good. So we, we could say, uh-uh, it's not that she's not loved or wanted or she's got full circles, her family's fine, the school's great. The kid, we took it to a neuropsychological, there was a hormonal thing going on. OK? But do you, do you get the point? This is particularly pertinent for kids with crazy behavior. And Jack and I can tell you, all the ex-cons that we dealt with, this is what their life looked like. They may have had full outer circles of paid people, like paid drug people, parole officers. But when you got to who is really intimate in your life, nobody, you know. Nobody who wasn't paid. But that's the point of this exercise. Now, here's the mistake part. And this is what we've learned. I'm going to wind up on this, and then we can talk about it more informally or whatever. 
the, the name of the game then is to fill people's circles. And you think you can do that in one damn exercise, <laughs> you have missed the point. Jack made, to me, the key point in Jack's presentation. And somebody in one of the groups, I was so glad to hear that they said, you know, I was looking for answers, and it's a trial and error process. You know, how many years later with Judith? 14 years later. Next week, there's still 9,000 meetings with the minister. There's still a $30,000 deficit. There's still days that we want to all shoot ourselves. There's still going on and on. You know what she tells parents? It's going to go on and on and on. Because in this society, still, if you're a person in a wheelchair or a person with Down syndrome, or a, you're not, it's not easy. It's not easy if you're a person period these days, unless you have a gazillion dollars. But then you just add layers and layers of complexity. So we say our first job in our school is to fill these circles. So we don't say, and will you be Carmi's friend? Yeah. <laughs> you want to turn off the kids in two minutes? You know, who wants to be Judith's friend? Gag, gag. <laughs> you utter the magic words. Who would like to get involved with us adults in trying to figure out how to include the person? And that changes schools. That just changes the whole thing. Not how do we get the curriculum modified? How do we adapt reading? You know, I mean, give me a break. Figure it out. You know, and you know who will figure it out? The other kids. They know if you ask them. And therein lies the difference between a school with a problem-solving approach and a school with a fixation on curriculum. Okay? And if you read the literature, all the good schools, all the effective schools deal with this stuff. They're schools where kids feel they belong. So what does the literature tell us? In order to have mentally healthy and cognitively healthy adults, people need to feel they belong and feel loved to feel control, to feel power, and to have fun. Those are the four elements in the mental health literature. Number one, belonging. So you all, any of you who are in charge of school systems need to ask the question that they dared to ask to these 1,500 high school kids who said, no, we don't feel we belong. All right? And then you can have fun figuring out what to do. So that's basically the strategy we're going to let you got, let, spend a lot of time talking about it with each other. OK. Just, just strategically, when you go to fill up these circles for someone, first of all, you, I mean, if, if you don't talk about this, of course, you're not going to deal with it. So first of all, you've got to name it. If you don't even admit there's an issue, then um, nothing's going to happen. So intentionality becomes a real issue. Secondly. If some child arrives in a classroom who, for some strange reason, happens to be a little different, there are, there's one child in the classroom who knows a lot about that difference. It's not a surprise to them. They've known it for quite a while. They know they don't walk without some wheels. You don't have to make a secret out of it. In fact, if you put it on the table for 10 minutes with the kids and talk about it, it's a dead issue because the kids are no longer interested in that. <clears throat> They're interested in, can we get down the hall faster on foot or using a wheelchair? They're interested in a thousand things, but not what's a wheelchair or why is Katie different or something, because they're no longer interested in it. It becomes a non-issue when you name it and when you deal with it. So when you do this exercise that we just did with you and you ask kids, what, would, what do you think? See, and if this is Katie, what do you think? How would you act? How would you behave? What would you do if your life looked like that? And six-year-olds will answer suicide. Pretty scary stuff. Teachers freak out. They shouldn't know that word. They do. They know. Because they know that belonging is the number one, 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 and one issue in their life. And they know without it, they don't want to live. So you say, if Katie's lo life looks like that, what are we going to do about it? 
And they say, well, we, we got to fill circles, right? Or we got we to gotta fill Katie's life up. Then how are we going to do that? And that's where just getting everybody to say that, which is real easy, is step one. But then you have to be intentional. It's not, well, we're all agreed. Isn't it nice? We can all go home now. Wrong. Because nothing will happen. I mean, something might happen. But who's going to be on the phone tree to call Katie Monday? Who's on for Tuesday? Who's on for Wednesday? Who's on for Thursday? The dance next week. Which gang is Katie going to the dance with? OK. Who's going for pizza on Thursday? Whose birthday party is next? Is Katie going to be there? Who's going I mean, on it? Not very complex problems. See, one of the things around curriculum that's fascinating, what's the number one issue in curriculum in North America today? We want to teach people to be creative problem solvers. The problem is, how do you do that? The answer is, Give people real experience with real problems. Katie is a real life problem. People can understand that. Six year olds can understand that. Because they can understand this is really important stuff. So the strategy for how do you fill circles is you move from the outside in. Somebody already figured that out, you see? They know. So what you want to do is get Katie in 50 places where she's with a bunch of other kids and people doing things. Some of which Katie will decide she isn't very interested in. That's fine. You can cross those off. She doesn't have to be a girl guide. She might be. That might be the best thing possible. But you try them out. And what you'll find out is some of them take off. And when you get Katie in a bunch of groups and organizations, and she goes to church, and she goes to Sunday school, and she does 50 things, somewhere in those groups, some people, some magic's going to happen. You don't know which ones. It just happens. So intentionally, you have to engineer that people have the opportunity. And that's where the, the organizing takes place. I've, I've been suggesting that. If you talk to the children, sometimes they know a lot more than you think. <clears throat> now, this child is six, and this child happens to come from Saskatchewan, my home. This means that we all know that children in Saskatchewan are genetically superior. <laughs> so, so that uh, we wouldn't expect that six-year-olds, wherever you come from, could possibly be as incisive and intelligent as this particular six-year-old. but. We learned this from Groucho Marx, who said that if you want to have a real problem, you better ask a six-year-old. <laughs> and you know, then you start to get answers. So we asked some kids, and this just happens to be one, what they thought about community living and friendship. And this is an answer. I think community living is where you live on your block and you go to school. Or if you're big, you can go to work. And if you're a kid, you can go to swimming lessons and brownies or girl guides when you're bigger. And you can go to the store with your mom and dad. And you go to McDonald's yourself, because you have your own money. And you have friends to play with on your street. And maybe you have a paper route. And you can go to the library and walk your dog. Or go to birthday parties like I did on Saturday. And you can have sleepovers. And you know people when you walk down the street. And people wave at you and say hello, because they know you. And you say hello back. Because that's how to be a friend. I think that's what community living means, right? See, six-year-olds do know. This video was produced by the Center for Ministry with Disabled People of the University of Dayton in Dayton, Ohio.